everybody, welcome to the Vineyard Community Church live stream. If you're watching this live or you're coming back to the sermon to watch it again, we're so glad you're here. If you're a first time guest, we're so glad that you chose today to check out Vineyard. If you like taking notes and staying up to date on everything Vineyard, then download our VCC app where you can take interactive notes with us and follow along with the sermons. Also on the app, we have a connect card, which you can fill out to let us know that you are watching along with the live stream. Also on the connect card, there is a list of possible next steps following today's message. You can sign up for upcoming events or request information. Also, if there's anything we can be praying for you, you can fill that out in the connect card on the lines provided and know that you will be prayed for this week. Again, thank you so much for joining us on the live stream. The sermon's about to begin. Feel free to interact in the chat area, and we look forward to connecting with you on our live stream. following Jesus. What's it all about? I mean, I've heard of this man, but I've had my doubts that he is a plan and I should follow his route. How long will it take? I've said the prayer, I've punched my ticket. Shouldn't that be the end of the race? What's the end game? Is there more than just a destination? I want to get to the top, but I know I need transformation. How can I move up? What more can I continue to do? How can I fill my cup after all that I've been through? What about me? What do I have to do? I'm very new to this and my experiences are few. So let's make this happen. How do I accelerate my way through? I want to stomp on the gas pedal and achieve where the stats are few. Am I alone? Sometimes it feels like I have no one to phone. My life hasn't been the easiest and people turn their backs. Sometimes I question if I even have a home. Can I still be me? What is the cost of being so-called free? Do I have to do what everyone else is doing? Or does God have something for me specifically? I'm Mark Warner, I'm the lead. This is our 50-day event that we are working through as a church. We're so glad you made it out today. It's raining on a Sunday again. Can I get an amen? <laughs> and so uh, we just want to make sure that you know that we're glad you came because we know it's not easy to do on days like today when it's in the 40s and the Chiefs don't play till tonight. And, and we're going to have to pray because they're going to destroy New England. And so, you know, it's... Uh, Wow, that's the, that's, now it's time to take the offering after that reaction. <laughs> I'm going to ask our ushers to please come forward. And as I do that, I want to remind you that we have Kids Fest coming up on October 31st. It's an annual event that we do for children ages 4th grade and younger. And so moms and dads, be aware of that. There are two quick ways, guys, that you can help. One of them is, is volunteer. It takes an army of people. We transform the interior of the auditorium, the gym, and all of that. There's popcorn in bouncy houses. There's popcorn in the bouncy houses. It's amazing. And so we want to make you aware that there's a, a magic show. There's a balloon animal thing going on. There's just so many things happening on the 31st. So we need volunteers for that. And then secondly, we need you to bring us tons and tons of high fructose corn syrup. 
masquerading <laughs> as candy, all right? And so please consider doing that, bringing in lots and lots of candy. You can take it to the desk in the lobby. Your giving, your faithful giving here at Vineyard, if you're, if you're participating in giving here at Vineyard, makes events like that possible. May the Lord bless you as you give. band can you thank the band for me We're just so grateful for the all the musicians here at vineyard and the people who faithfully serve in that way it's such a blessing you know before i teach this morning uh, I, I want to mention what some of you probably already know and that is that one of our longtime members and a dear friend to so many folks here at vineyard Jeannie flannery passed away on friday night after a couple, three years of battling cancer. Um, Jeannie is what Diane and I refer to as one of the originals. Those are the people that were at this church 18 years ago when I first came and are still here today. In other words, the most long-suffering people <laughs> on the planet. And so I, I, I just, when, when we lose one of the originals, it, it, it's especially hard for us because of, uh, of the connection we've had all of these years. And I know most of you who knew her longer than even I have, have that same sense. I just want you to be aware there is a memorial service. It's this coming Tuesday afternoon at four o'clock right here in the auditorium. Um, if you w can come and make it, I, I'd really encourage you to be here as we celebrate the life uh, of a woman who really loved Jesus. Why don't we bow together? I'm going to pray for the family. Let's bow together. Father, um, I'm grateful for your grace in times like this for family members and friends. It seems, Father, that no matter, even if we see it coming, that we feel the loss keenly, Lord, no matter what. And so f I pray for grace, Lord God, for the family, especially today. I pray for the extended family. I, I ask you, Lord, for her friends, so many of her friends here at Vineyard, Lord. I, I, I praise you, God, for her testimony. I thank you, Father, that we can celebrate a woman who we know is in your presence. And we ask you, God, in Jesus' name to... Uh, not only let Tuesday be just a wonderful time uh, of remembrance, but also, Lord, uh, I pray that you would uh, come and bring your comfort and your grace. Thank you, God, that uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so, God, I praise you that she is with you today. Thank you, Father, for her. I pray now, Lord God, for your incredible power and grace to rest on this teaching. 
I pray, Lord, that we would have open hearts and be receptive to you and receive what you have for us today. There is no one here today, whether they are joining us here in, their, in, in body or whether they are watching via the live stream, there is no one gathering at this moment who was not appointed to be here for this time. And so, God, I pray that, that we would just lean into you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to continue our series entitled Following Jesus, and if you're here for the first time, you need to know that we are exploring over the the next eight weeks what it means to follow Jesus using a series of eight questions. And so in week number one, we asked the question, following Jesus, what is it all about? And in that message, I explored a handful of things that we as Christians have been led to believe it's all about, but it's not all about. We've been led to believe it's all about holiness, becoming more like Jesus, that that's the only reason Jesus came and died on the cross, is so that he could make clones, right? Or we've been led to believe that it's all about wholeness, getting healed up, or service, only to conclude that Jesus didn't ultimately die on the cross to make us like himself, or free us from our habits, our hurts, and our hang-ups. He didn't simply die on the cross so that that, that he could have co-workers. No, these things are the benefit. These things are the byproducts of following Jesus, but they're not what following Jesus is all about. So what is it all about? It's all about love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It is all about love. It has always only been about love. It is about restoring the love relationship between the creator and his creation. Jesus died on the cross to restore the love relationship that was shattered by sin. As Tom Ashbrook wrote, love is the essence of our relationship with God and its goal. It's all about divine love. It's about learning to abide in his love and rest in his love. It's about being rooted and grounded in love and learning to live fully and freely in his love for us. That is what it's all about. His love is his unwavering gift to us. Our love for him is simply the byproduct of us learning to live in his love for us. And when we understand that, when we resolve to make our love relationship with God the single priority of our lives, that loving relationship, it produces incredible fruit. It produces the fruits of holiness and wholeness and service and mission and so much more. Fulfilling the Great Commission is a natural byproduct, the direct result of living the Jesus life, of allowing yourself to be loved by God and loving him in repentance. The work of God, the mission of God, all of it flows from a growing and dynamic love relationship with God. And those who allow themselves to be thoroughly loved by God, who learn to rest in his love, are rooted in his love, secure in his love, they can't help but grow. They can't help but grow. They can't help but make progress. Now look, the Jesus life is full of invitations. God means to draw you, not drive you through life. And this first invitation, the most fundamental invitation, is an offer of unconditional love. He loves you so much, he offers you his love and invites you to live in his love and rest in his love and live out of the foundation of his love instead of a sense of duty and obligation and compulsion or fear that you might not be good enough to get into heaven. Do you have a love relationship with Jesus? Are you in love with him? Because he's in love with you. That's what it's all about. Now, last week, Pastor David addressed a second question, following Jesus, how long will it take? And in that message, he artfully pivoted away from the goal of following Jesus and started talking about and describing the process 
of following Jesus. Now, that's what we want to do with the remainder of this series. The idea is, is if we can understand the way that God works with us over the course of our lives, we can learn to cooperate with God in our own spiritual growth and development. We won't work so much against him uh, inadvertently or, or even uh, overtly, but we will work with him if we can understand how he works with us. How, then, do we describe the process of following Jesus? What does the process of following Jesus look like? Well, as David said a a week ago, the first thing you need to know is that following Jesus involves an ongoing, lifelong process of surrender. And as the Apostle Paul wrote, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Or as author Eugene Peterson so beautifully put it in the message translation of that section. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what, that, what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. Don't become a, so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Following Jesus begins with taking your everyday ordinary life and faithfully placing it before God as an offering, surrendering yourself to him bit by bit over the course of your life. Let me add a second idea to help fill out your understanding of how the process works. The question today is, can I still be me? And the short answer is, yes, you can. In fact, your journey with Jesus is both formative and unique. Your journey with Jesus is both formative and unique. Now, I'm going to explain that, of course, because that's what you pay me to do. So here we go. Your journey with Jesus is a formative journey. Your journey with Jesus is a formative journey. Now, here's what we mean. If you fall in love with Jesus, it will change you. You will not be what you were any longer. No, the moment you step onto the trail with Jesus, the process of your transformation begins. Walk with Jesus, and among other things, you come under the influence of Jesus, the gentle prodding of Jesus, the wisdom of Jesus, and he means to develop you over the course of your journey. It's a patient process, but it is a process nonetheless. Walk with Jesus, and you will not be what you were. You will not remain as you are. Your budding love relationship with Jesus, the blessing of his attentions, your close association with him over the course of your life will have a profound and lasting influence on your development. Psychologists often refer to the first few years of a child's life as the formative years. Have you heard that terminology? They talk about it as the formative years where basic learning and development occurs, forming the essential building blocks for all of life. With Jesus, they're all formative years, right? I mean, they're all formative years. You'll have seasons, as you walk with Jesus, of incredibly rapid growth and development, like the summer when you grew five inches between eighth and ninth grade. And you'll have seasons where your progress along the path seems painfully slow, like the three months before you were old enough to get a driver's license. I mean, it's hard sometimes to measure your growth in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I often like to quote the Soren Kierkegaard said, life is lived forward but understood backward. Nevertheless, God is always up to something, and he never grows tired of working with you and forming you. And we see the process revealed so many places in Scripture, but especially in how Jesus worked with his disciples when he walked the earth. So in John chapter 6, we see Jesus in his every interaction with his disciples In every single circumstance, he's using what's available to him to shape them and influence them and form them. Now, 
This is what, what it's like to walk with Jesus. If you look at how Jesus walked with the disciples, you learn an awful lot about how it, what it means to walk with Jesus, to journey with Jesus, what it means to follow Jesus. Rooted and established in an unwavering relationship of love, Jesus carefully and painstakingly forms us over the course of our lives. And one of the tools, it's not the only tool, but one of the tools that Jesus uses to form you. you know, I'm, I've ever met anybody that ever worked with clay or somebody who ever painted paintings, but they have a variety of tools. They all have a different purpose. And one of the tools that Jesus uses to form us is testing. He tests us. And if you ever read John chapter 6, you'll say, see that over and over again, like six consecutive times, Jesus uses the circumstances with his disciples to actually bring about this testing. Now, that t chapter, as I said, recounts a series of tests that Jesus uses to train and shape and mold his disciples. I don't have the time to walk you through all six of them this morning, but I'm just going to use one by way of explanation. Let, let me show you this. In John chapter 6, verse 5, very famous thing is going on. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. So Jesus sets it up so that he can test Philip. Now, this test, I'm going to give it a name. I call this the test of inadequate supply. The test of of inadequate supply. Now, you, I know you guys are familiar with this test because it is a familiar test. It is a test that we encounter over and over again, so much so that after the first of the year, we're going to do a series here based on Psalm 23 called Life Without Lack. All right? And so we're going to talk about that after the first of the year, but I call this the test of inadequate supply. Philip and Andrew had done some mental arithmetic. Philip calculates the financial cost of feeding so many people. He looks out and sees more than 5,000, and that's just the men, and Andrew is standing over there. While Philip is doing the mental math, Andrew is calculating the amount of food that it would take to actually feed them. You can almost see them going over it together. These are the two bean counters inside the discipleship group. Let's see, we have five loaves of barley, and we have two fish. And we have 5,000 men, many of them are married, and if you haven't noticed, there's a bunch of kids running around this hillside. So that brings the total to somewhere close to 20,000 people. Let's see, 20,000 people into five loaves of bread. I don't think we have enough. The test of inadequate supply. And one of the tests that the Lord will regularly test you with is this test of inadequate supply. You know what I'm talking about? And the question he's asking in times of great need is simply this. Am I enough? Is Jesus plus nothing enough? You'll regularly find yourself in situations in which you will do the math and you will discover that the resources are simply inadequate to the need. The math will not add up. I mean, have you ever come up short? You know, someone asks you to lead a small group or speak at a workshop, you feel so inadequate, you look at yourself, your resources, you say, I just don't have what it takes. Can I just offer you this morning, on this beautiful Sunday morning, can I just offer you a brief word of encouragement when you feel inadequate? Here it is. You are inadequate. <laughs> and so am I. You might say, well, I understand what Jesus has done for me, but I feel so unworthy. I know I shouldn't feel that way, but I feel so unworthy. Listen to me a second. You are unworthy. You are unworthy. I'm unworthy. Allow me to deliver you from the notion of somehow achieving some modicum of worthiness before God. You are unworthy. The good news is Jesus supplies what you cannot 
Look at verse 10. He said, have the people sit down. There were, was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed those who were seat, to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they had all enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Now how was the hunger of the people satisfied? Not by chopping up the fish into 20,000 pieces. There is not even a Ginzu knife that could do that. Okay? There isn't a knife made that could cut it that finely. I mean, the, 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 I mean and that's just assuming that everybody there likes sushi. I don't get it. Okay? And so this crowd's hunger was satisfied by a miracle from Jesus. He multiplied the loaves and the fish. He supplied what they could not. Now let me ask you a question. Is there any area of your life where you have to confess that you have run out of resource? Is there any area of your life? I mean, maybe it's something that God wants you to do for which your supply is inadequate. Inadequate supply is a test, guys. He's testing you. He's forming you. He's shaping you. You've run out of love in your marriage. Your heart has grown cold. Can Jesus multiply the love in your marriage? He can. Can he supply the two of you with fresh feelings of love? He can. Jesus can take your little bit of faithfulness and your little bit of obedience and your little bit of prayer and multiply it so that, that the entire need, whatever the need might be, is met. Let me, let me finish this point with some images to kind of help you think about what's happening when you face difficulty, heartache, and pain. It's a test. I, I just think of it as a test. It's, it's, I've often referred to it here at Vineyard as God's pop quizzes, you know. Now, I'm not saying that God sends everything your way. N definitely not. But, but God is definitely in control of the process. And I believe that difficult circumstances are a pop quiz from God, among other things. I mean, you, you may feel well prepared. You may feel that you've arrived in terms of your relationship with God. And then and God, all of a sudden, will give you a pop quiz. And he will say, let me see how you're really doing. And sometimes you do really well. And you pass the test. And you pat yourself on the back. And now you have a whole new thing to pray about. <laughs> Temptation comes your way and you push it aside. But sometimes you fail miserably. You start grumbling. You complain. You freak out. God knows what you're about. He's not quizzing you to find out new information about you. He's not trying to figure you out. God is never shocked by how you do on his quizzes. He's never surprised. Oh, you got eight out of ten. Well done. Didn't see that coming. He's never surprised. But we need to see how we're doing ourselves. We need to know how we're doing in an area. We need to see it. Am I growing in patience? Am I growing in kindness? Am I growing in faithfulness? And we all need to be shown over and over again our need for him and our need for growth and maturity. Let me give you a different picture. Uh, one of the Greek words for testing in the Bible literally means to be squeezed or pressured. Now, I really love this word. It means to be squeezed or pressured. I think of testing then like, like squeezing a tube of toothpaste. You squeeze the tube and what's inside comes shooting out. You might not have realized that. I'm just trying to help you with your daily lives. You squeeze the tube of toothpaste, and what's inside comes shooting out. Now, I believe that trials are negative circumstances, and negative circumstances are designed to put the squeeze on you to show you what's inside you. Any of you ever been squeezed? Being squeezed right now? Has someone put the squeeze on you? Okay, maybe you got into a misunderstanding with another person. They misread you or misread your motives. Have you ever been squeezed by that? Have you ever been squeezed by financial difficulties or by illness or by family conflict or by pressure at work? If so, let me ask you, what's coming out of you? When you get older, 
and you get squeezed by the ravages of older age. When you get squeezed because you don't sleep as well, or you don't have as much physical strength, or you're not able to do some of the things that you used to be able to do, what's coming out of you? See, that's the thing. What is coming out of you? See, it's difficulty that reveals what's really inside of you. It's easy, so easy to maintain your patience and your love when everything is going well and you're just sailing along. But when your boat is taking on water, when that's when you find out what you're really made of. It's what comes out of you in a crisis, no matter what age you are, that reveals how far along in the process of following Jesus you actually are. Do you know that the testing is designed to help you answer the question, what do I really want out of life? I mean, do you want to be mature? Do you want to be like Jesus? Do you want to follow Jesus? Do you want to grow up? If so, then embrace what is happening to you as part of God's process. Because if your goal is to have it go easy in your life and to have a minimum amount of conflict to keep your head down and wait out every storm, you will never grow up. The Lord tests us for the purpose of maturing us. God tests us to develop perseverance in us. Now, we have a living illustration of this as a staff on the north end of the building. You guys know that several years ago when we began this building project, the city of Overland Park, known as the City of Trees, okay, asked us to put in 65 more trees around our property. I'm like, where? <laughs> they were only too happy to let us know where. So we have all of these beautiful variety of trees all around the property. Well, about a year after we put all the trees in around the property, there was this incredibly huge windstorm. Have you guys noticed that it gets a little windy out here in Kansas? Just something that just popped up. And so like, it just popped up, and one of the trees bent almost all the way down to the ground. In fact, part of its root was actually, the root ball was actually like, 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 you know, like exposed. I can't think. Exposed. You got finish the sentences for me, okay? And so... And so it's right outside my window. And I, I talked to David. We looked at it. We were like, uh, you know, David and I, the outdoorsmen that we are, and tree surgeons. <laughs> we stood over that for all of 11 seconds. <laughs> looked at it and said, yeah, that's probably not good. <laughs> and then uh, we got somebody who really knew what they were doing involved. And they said, you know what? I said, well, shouldn't we, like, pull it back up and maybe stake it out so that it has a chance to really go? No, no, that'll kill it. I'm like, if you put it upright again, it'll kill it? They're like, yeah, and now that this has happened, you, you either have to just take it out altogether or just let it go. It was like almost all the way down to the ground. Now, this is like two years ago. So we did what we do in these situations. We did nothing. Um, <laughs> as long as it's not over the road, I'm not worried about it, right? And so I'm like, okay. And so we just said, let's, let's see what happens. And so over the last two years, I have watched out my window, almost like a daily snapshot of this tree slowly rolling its roots deeper and deeper and pulling itself back up. Now, it may never be fully upright ever again. It's still a listing just a little bit to the right, right? But this tree is now the tallest of all of the 65 trees we planted around the property. It is taller it is bigger. It is dwarfing the other trees. And it is leaning like the leaning tower of Pisa. Okay? And you're saying, Mark, what is your point? I really don't have one. I just wanted to tell that story. <laughs> the, the, no, the point is, right, is that testing, when you face testing, the wind needs to blow for you to grow. The wind needs to blow for you to grow. Ryan, I need to get into a rap video. Where are you? The wind needs to blow for you to grow. And if there is no root, HLI students, there will be no fruit. If there is no root, there will be no fruit. 
This is what testing is all about. Now, for most of us, when the heat is turned up, we want to run. But sometimes God keeps us simmering on the stove for a while because he's pressing the question, do you really want to be mature? Perseverance is the ability to continue when all you really want to do is quit. It means that you don't bolt and run. You don't drop out of sight. Testing produces the ability to not give up in the face of problems, to keep trusting and praying and believing and obeying and following. And when we do, we become more mature. You know, the thing we've noticed the most as pastors is when people go through times of testing, one of the first things they do is they stop coming to church as if that's a good idea. Like, I, uh, I won't go to church anymore. Like, we're going like to punish God for not making everything perfect and cushy. It's like, come on. It's about growing up. That's an immature way to live. See, God is in control of this whole process. Now, I, I know God sees my weaknesses. God knows my rough edges, and he knows what needs to be knocked off. God is like a potter. I mean, have you ever watched a potter forming a clay pot? Sometimes the clay has to be slapped around quite a bit. The potter can get pretty rough with the clay from time to time. I love this image. It, you know, it, were, it looks like the clay at times, if you watch a potter, it, it's like it's being beaten and thrown all over the wheel. Like they pick it up and they're like, wham. They just throw it down, but in the end, it becomes this beautiful vessel. Now, some of our difficulties and stresses and relational problems can be looked at as, well, the potter has me on the wheel again. I, don't, I didn't invite it, and I don't enjoy it, but I know that he's making something out of nothing, and in that, I rejoice. <laughs> now, I can tell you, and I, and I say this without even a hint of spiritual boasting, that from time to time, I've been able to rejoice in difficulty. Not always. Not even the majority of the time. I'm still more likely to turn to self-pity or envy or anger and all the rest. I mean, this last week when Diane and I were for a, at a, at a week-long meeting in Colorado, I developed uh, inexplicably on the opening day of the meeting an allergic reaction to who knows what, probably bighorn sheep or, or the outdoors, right? I, I was breathing air with less oxygen content. And I developed this rash that began on Monday of a week-long meeting, and the rash began on Monday, and despite my best efforts, the itching was absolutely unbearable, and it eventually turned into hives that were all over my body. I looked like a walking leprosy man. It was like, it grew all over my body, only going to the doctor like when I got back a week later, and a course of steroids has stemmed the tide, which comes to me, this is the first sermon I've ever preached in 35 years on steroids, and I'm loving it. <laughs> I don't care if you are. So, from... From time to time, I really feel like God is cornering me and pressuring me and leaving me no option other than to cry out to him. I'm at this meeting, I'm itching to beat the band, and I have to do 19 separate meetings in this thing. I'm sitting there the whole time. They had to think I was insane <laughs> or had to go to the bathroom or something. It's good for me, God. To be dependent upon you. It is good for me now that I see that you are my only hope. It's then that I come to the realization that I'm actually getting somewhere. That's what's at stake, by the way. Will you persevere? He's forming you. It's a process. Will you cooperate with the process? And here's the second thing. Your journey with Jesus is also a unique journey. It's a unique journey. The Apostle Paul hints at this beautifully in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. He says, if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will make alive your dead body also through the spirit which dwells in you. Now, I'm going to have to break this out for you a little bit. It's an interesting verse. In other words, it's God who brings life out of death. God brings life out of death, and here's the unique part. We all, 
have varying degrees of deadness in our lives. We all have varying degrees of deadness. Can I put it to you like this? We're all uniquely dead in a variety of ways. Amen? Aren't you glad you came to church today? Can I get an amen? You are all uniquely dead in a variety of ways. Okay, now hear me out. You are uniquely you. You might be a chip off the old block, but you're still just a chip. You might take after your mother or your father. You might have been influenced by your friends, your family, your culture. But there's no one precisely like you. You are, can I say it, a little snowflake. And that's what I love about you. Take any personality assessment that you like. Myers-Briggs, the Strength Finder, the Enneagram, they're all helpful, but they all categorize you into one of five groups or eight groups or a combination of groups. They're helpful as far as they go, and I would certainly recommend them, but like every other tool for self-assessment, they're a bit limited. Then add to your personality, your preferences, your unique deadness, that comes as a result of your sin choices or the sins of others against you, the unique circumstances of your birth and the way that you were raised, your unique set of influences, the unique context within which you've lived your life these many years, and you can quickly see, considering all of the factors, that the process of transformation is simply beyond you. No self-help book can help yourself enough okay no self-help book can help yourself enough even if you apply everything that they tell you to do and do everything that they say that they themselves are probably unable to do this is why we walk with jesus this is what he's doing with us as we walk along when you give him that kind of access when jesus becomes the love of your life When Jesus is your primary influencer, when his opinion is all that matters, when Jesus, motivated by perfect love, is the one who holds sway over your life, when he is the primary influencer of your life, it changes you. It's transforming. It's restoring. I love what Professor Robert Mulholland wrote about this. Here's what he wrote. Here is the great work of God in the process of spiritual formation. God is at work in the areas of our deadness to transform them into life in the image of Christ. This is the essential nature of our pilgrimage. Here is where God is working to form each of us to the image of Christ for the sake of others. God's work is unique in each person because none of us has exactly the same configuration of the dead body. Our dead body, that complex structure of harmful habits, deeply ingrained attitudes, troubling perspectives, destructive ways of relating to others, unhealthy modes of reacting and responding to the world, is very individual. We may share some of the same general forms of deadness, but the nature of our deadness is always uniquely shaped to us. You have lived in a unique variety of circumstances. Diane and I raised four children, all of them wonderful, but we always joke with Lexi, our oldest, that she got a worse parent than our youngest did. They weren't raised by the same parents. The oldest one was raised by 20-something mostly parents who were incredibly cool in so many ways, (laughs) but really inexperienced. By the time we got to Savannah at the end of the, of the line, the, the, the fourth child, we had made a lot of mistakes and learned from our mistakes. So no, even two children in the same family are raised by the exact same way. I mean, it's just an interesting thing, isn't it, that, that everything about you, including your unique set of circumstances, produces in you what the Apostle Paul referred to as a very unique set of dead things that need to be restored. And as a result... The nature of his work in your life is always uniquely shaped to you. See, contrary to popular opinion, the world doesn't actually celebrate your individuality. The world tells you that it's all about you being you, but they don't want you to be you. You, They want you to be like them. 
They're not celebrating your individuality. They're not actually comfortable with diversity. They don't appreciate differing expressions or the uniqueness of the individual. What I mean is, is that the world, it, it talks a good game but doesn't live it out. The world is fine with you being you so long as you agree with them. Toe the party line, support all the right causes, say all the right things. And it's not just the world. You know what? We see this pressure to conform in the body of Jesus Christ as well. It reminds me of something Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 20, 23. He said, woe to you. In other words, I feel so sorry for you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Wow. He's talking to the most religious people of his day. The kind of people who live such scrupulous lives that you and I would blush at the difference. It means that the Pharisees were not content to simply make converts to Judaism. They wanted converts to Phariseeism. The Pharisees were a sect inside of Judaism in competition with the Sadducees and the Essenes. They were all Jews... But they didn't all believe the same things. And again, I, I love the way the message reads this particular verse. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees, frauds. You go halfway around the world to make a convert, but once you get him, you make him into a replica of yourselves. Double damned. See, the Pharisees... They wanted every convert to look like a Pharisee and think like a Pharisee and believe like a Pharisee. That cookie-cutter attitude is still present in the church. You know, in many unsafe churches, groups, and organizations, the unspoken message is we alone are right. We have the purest truth. As I often say here, we have the cleanest Jesus. Our Jesus is better than their Jesus. Their Jesus over there at that church, he's a compromised Jesus. He's a washed-out Jesus. He's a watered-down Jesus. He's a politically correct Jesus. He's not the real Jesus. The real Jesus is more, well, like me. Have you ever encountered that attitude in a church? Do you know what that attitude produces? It produces a church full of clones. People who look like the leader and talk like the leader and dress like the leader and pray like the leader and live like the leader because he or she claims to possess absolute truth. The Pharisees wanted to produce more Pharisees. Conservatives want to produce more conservatives. Liberals want everyone to be liberal. Progressives want more progressives. There's no end to the political ideologies, social, ideo social ideologies, religious ideologies, socioeconomic ideologies. All believe that they alone are right and everyone else is wrong. And if you don't agree with them, you're an old-fashioned, unenlightened, backward-thinking, uneducated, uninformed, unpatriotic, sexist, bigoted, troglodyte whose ideas and opinions need to be outlawed or suppressed or discounted or vilified or simply ignored. I could say to the world around us, by the way, can I just say this? Christianity has outgrown the two-party system. It's odd, isn't it? In a world that supposedly celebrates our differences, how often we hear people advocate for everyone being the same. So the world would be a better place if there were no borders, or if we could just simply grow past the need for religion, or if we could eliminate the gap between the very rich and the very poor, or if everyone was on an equal footing, or if we could just balance the scales, or if we could erase gender stereotypes, or if we could go back and rewrite history, if the, the lazy and the chronically dependent would just start pulling their weight, if you could all just be more like me, the world would be a better place. This idea reminds me of the old Steve Taylor song from the 1980s talking about his church experience. Steve Taylor wrote a song entitled, I Want to Be a Clone. Does anybody remember it? I'm going to quote it for you. I didn't put it on the screen because it's long, but I'm just going to quote it for you. I've grown, gone through so much other stuff that walking down the aisle was tough. Now I know it's not enough. I want to be a clone. I asked the Lord into my heart. They say this is the way to start. Now you've got to play your part. I want to be a clone. Be a clone and kiss conviction goodbye. 
Cloneliness is next to godliness, right? I'm grateful that they showed the way because I could never know the way to serve him on my own. They told me that I'd fall away unless I followed what they say. Who needs the Bible anyway? I want to be a clone. Their language, it was new to me, but Christianese got through to me. Now I speak it fluently, I want to be a clone. So now I see the whole design. My church is just an assembly line. My parts are there, I'm feeling fine, I want to be a clone. I've learned enough to stay afloat, but not so much to rock my boat. I'm glad they shoved it down my throat. I want to be a clone. Cloneliness is not next to godliness. Jesus has no interest in carbon copies. You are uniquely you. Good, bad, and ugly. You know, Jesus sees the better you than you ever will. Jesus sees that better than anyone else, better than you see you, But he also sees what you were meant to be. He sees your original glory because he's the originator of that glory. And as a result, like a master artisan, he will patiently and painstakingly strip off the layers of varnish that have accumulated over the years. He will repair the tears and the scratches inflicted by your sin choices and the sins of others against you. He will touch up and restore what's faded or been worn away as creative as he was in the beginning in your original design. He will devise ways over the course of your journey with him to influence influence you and challenge you and test you and train you playing once again with the raw material that is you clearing away the debris smoothing the flaws restoring you to what he meant for you to be his unique one of a kind of creation he has no interest in clones or copies every painting jesus does is unique even Claude Monet, the the French Impressionist, who became so enamored with his flower garden and lily pond at his home in Giverny that he needed to get out more, okay? He felt the need to paint it more than 250 times. He never duplicated his work. 250 times he painted, this is just four of them, 250 times he painted his garden and the water lilies and no two paintings are alike. Can you still be you? Yes, of course. But not the you you want to be. Not the willful you. Not the selfish you. Not the I did it my way, you. The painting doesn't paint itself. The clay doesn't mold itself. The you, you decide to be. The choices that you make cannot compare, will never compare to what Jesus the originator had in mind for you. When you join Jesus on the trail, when you choose to follow him, you come as you are, but you don't get to stay as you are. No matter how faded and tarnished and worn and stained and damaged you might be, he means to restore you to your original glory. Every creation is part of the creator, a snapshot that reveals something about him. When we say that you're meant to be like Jesus, you're not, we're not saying that you're meant to be Jesus. There is only one creator, there is only one originator, there is only one savior, there is only one master, one potter, one painter. And his every creation reveals something about himself. Sin clouds that image where for many of us we can't see, no one can see the beauty for the ashes. But he never loses sight of the you that he meant for you to be. He sees through the tarnish and the damage and the dirt and the the wear. And the only question as you follow him is will you submit to the process? Will you stay faithful through the bumps, the rubs, and the tests? That is his invitation to you. He will make you uniquely what you were meant to be. Will you follow him and let him restore you? Let's all stand together.
We'll ask our prayer team to please come. Would you bow with me before the Lord? We try so hard, especially in this culture, and with all the people on the planet, we try so hard to get noticed, to carve out a space for ourselves, to leave a mark on the world, to matter, in some cases to make a difference. We try and we strive just to, you know, get enough likes or enough hits on YouTube or something so that people will pay attention to us so that we can tell ourselves that we are somebody. And here's my message to you this morning is that you are somebody in Christ Jesus. And you are only the only person who can be what he made you to be. You are literally the only person who can be what he made you to be. Will you follow Jesus? Will you follow him? Hey, look, with your heads bowed right now, I'm asking you this question. Will you follow Jesus? I'm not asking you if you will see it through every day from now to the end of your life. You're going to have days when it won't be so easy. But what I want to know this morning, and I think this is God's invitation to you, and I think this is his regular invitation to all of us, is he says this. Forget about the length of the journey or the time you have left. Will you just take this next step with me? Will you not be content with your current experience of me? Some of us get on the path with Jesus and we get stuck. We get stuck. We might spend 20 years just standing there, not moving. We're on the path, but we're not making progress. And Jesus says, will you just, can, can we move along? Can we just take one step? Would you do that? Would you change it up? Would you, would you press in a little bit? Would you, I mean, if you can't take it, if you, if you can't buy in today to the whole journey, will you take the next step with him? So I want to encourage you to come forward for prayer right now as we begin to worship. I want to encourage you to come forward for prayer. We're going to pray for people here at the front. The communion table, again, is available here to my left and my right. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to help us to lean into the one who can make us what we were meant to be. Why don't you come for prayer? If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to come forward and, and do that this morning. There are people here that would be, just walk up and say, I've never, I haven't even been on the trail with Jesus. This is the first time I've heard that this was even possible. I would love to give my life to him. These folks here at the front will help you to do that this morning if you'll just step out and come for prayer. Let's worship together as we pray, and in a few moments we'll close the service with a blessing. May the Lord bless you as you come. If God has placed anything on your heart during this prayer time or during the sermon, please comment down below or send us a private message so we can be praying for you. We're here for you. Thank you again for joining us on the live stream, and we cannot wait to see you in person.